Hello, I'm Otis Corbett, and today I want to share a word about how God changes us as I comment on 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 10. This passage reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than all they, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. From time to time, I'll hear someone say something that just sticks with me, for better or for worse, and what they said often comes to mind. One time, I remember a senior citizen lady who was complaining about her daughter-in-law, and what she said has stuck with me. She said, I asked my daughter-in-law what she was serving for lunch after church Sunday, and she said that she didn't know. I just don't understand how... Anyone can live like that. Well, I guess you had to be there. But it that's just stuck with me. I don't know why. They, that, fast, that, that's, that statement of hers has just stuck with me. Now, on a more serious note, I was sitting with some church members one day, and one of them shared about a former member who had gotten in trouble with the law. And what was said that has stuck with me is what someone said in reply to that. That person said, well, that doesn't surprise me at all. They lived a rough life before they started coming to church. And, you know, people don't really change, do they? Wow. As a Christian, we all need to be taken aback by that statement. God is in the life-changing business. In fact, unless we are changed by God, our destiny is to spend eternity in hell separated from Him and from all good things. In our focal passage for today, Paul told us that he was the least deserving of anyone of God's grace and mercy. He had persecuted the church. He was a conspirator in the death of Stephen. He deserved death and hell not the abundant life Jesus offers us in the here and now and in the hereafter also. But Paul was changed, and he was changed by God through Jesus. What does the New Testament tell us about how God changes us? Well, first, it tells us we are changed by our new birth in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man or any person, be in Christ. He's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So can people change? Well, no. That church member was right about this. Naturally, we're not able to change. We're not able to change without the grace of God. But can people change? Yes. When we are in Christ, we are new creatures and all things have become new. As one of my former pastors used to like to say, when we are in our natural sinful state, we don't need to turn over a new leaf. We need a new life. Jesus offers us that life and a chance to be reborn into the kingdom of God. So, How does God change us? He changes us by salvation, by 
making us to be born again. But next, the New Testament tells us that we are changed by growth in grace. In 2 Peter 3.18, we are instructed to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. When we are reborn into God's family, we have a new life, but we must also gain new knowledge. As we read God's Word, and as we uh, daily walk with the Holy Spirit in our lives, we grow in maturity and faith. Young children need to learn who they can trust and what things are good for them to do and what things are not good for them to do. That child that reaches for that hot stove needs to know that it's hot and it will burn that child. The same is true for a new believer. God is a patient and loving parent. He is willing to teach us, but He expects us to be willing students. As we grow in grace and in God's Word, we bless God, we bless ourselves, and we bless others. And He changes us to be more like Jesus every day. The New Testament also tells us that we are changed by prayer. Jesus is our model for that in Luke 9, 28 through 31. This passage tells us, And when it came to pass, about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus often spent time with God in prayer, and so should we. Prayer is not simply asking God to bless us or to bless other people. It's more than that. It is spending time with the one who loves us so much that he gave up his uniquely begotten son for us. Spending time with someone who loves us like God does changes us. Finally for today, the New Testament tells us we will be changed when Jesus comes back for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-53 tells us, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortality must put on immortality. The first part of this passage has been jokingly called the nursery worker verse, because the babies may not sleep, but they will all be changed. It's more encouraging than that, however. When Jesus comes back for us, we will all be changed into what He intends us to be and fit us for eternal life with Him in heaven. It will be the ultimate change process in our lives and finish the maturing work we've talked about in our devotional today. I was recently asked if I thought that the recent events in the Middle East and the decline of our culture and morality in the United States means that Jesus will be coming back soon. I said I don't know. I don't know what the trigger will be. No one knows what God's trigger will be for him to sound that last trumpet and send Jesus back for his church. But I'm ready. I'm ready. Bring it on. You see, if we're in Christ, we don't need to be afraid about the end of time. A lot of people get very upset and very focused on the end time events, but we don't need to worry about that because Jesus is coming back for us and we will see him face to face and he will change us to be like him. It will be a glorious time. Corruptible will put on in corruption, and the mortal will put on immortality. What's not to like about that? No, 
Without Jesus, people never really do change. I don't know uh, the spiritual state of that church member. I never knew that church member. Uh, I pray that that person was saved. And I pray that God would continue, had continued to work with him. I, I don't know what is the ultimate end of that story is. But without Jesus, we don't have the possibility of changing. We re never really do change. With him, however, we can grow and mature and become fit for the abundant life in the hereafter with our Lord and Savior. Are you ready for a change today? Well, if you are, Jesus is ready to help you here and now this day going forward. Are you ready for a change? Jesus is ready for you to change also. And he's there to help you. Thanks for watching. I'll be back soon with another word from the Bible we can share together. Every blessing, I'm Dr. Otis Corbett.